Hi, it's a pleasure to have been invited to present on postlateral coronary injuries, their diagnosis and management. I'm Dr. Brett Fritch in Sydney, Australia. These are my declarations. The region of the postlateral corner is one of complex anatomy. There's over 26 different structures named on anatomical dissection. And for a long time, it was considered very difficult to achieve a good outcome in severe injuries of this part of the knee anatomy. The great Jack Houston said, no knee injury with this type of injury can have an excellent result. But with improvements in understanding of the anatomy, biomechanics and different reconstruction techniques, that certainly changed in the last decade or more. The clinically relevant structures are the focus of our management the lateral collateral ligament, the popliteus complex made up of the main popliteus tendon and the popliteofibular ligament, the biceps femoris and the associated structures of the IT band, the postlateral capsule, the lateral meniscus and the common perineal nerve will be the structures we focus our attention on when addressing these complex injuries. I'm gonna divide up management of, of postlateral coronary into the acute and the delayed or chronic cases because they are di very different beasts and they require different parts of focus in terms of their appropriate management. In the acute injury, they tend to be high energy injuries often associated with multi-ligament injuries of the knee. They involve management of the entire patient from ES EMST principles, management of the limb, including the vascular and neurological structures, and then definitive management of the knee. In the delayed case, it's the diagnosis that can be more of a challenge. Uh, and the management of the knee uh, is the focus with few other associated injuries uh, complicating the management as it does in the acute case. In acute injuries, the pattern of injury is diverse. If we look at cruciate and lateral disruptions from our database, you can see multiple different combinations of injuries, and that's just focusing on the ligaments. The mechanism of is about half of them have come from motor vehicle accidents, about a quarter from sporting injuries. Two thirds are contact injuries and about 20% non-contact. Associated injuries are common as you'd expect from these high energy uh, injuries with uh, fractures to long bones, uh, spinal injuries, cardiothoracic injuries, and extremity injuries, all complicating the management of the knee. Local injuries, such as open wounds, uh, neurovascular disruption, meniscus, and plateau fractures are also common. Thus, the focus isn't just of the knee itself. Firstly, it's management of the patient with EMST principles, assessment, and management as required. Then specific management of the limb, particularly vascular and neurolo neurological structures, it may require reduction and temporary stabilization and ongoing neurovascular assessment. And finally, we get to management of the knee with specific imaging and definitive treatment of the postural corner. The vascular assessment is a critical part of managing these injuries as they are associated with knee dislocations uh, and disruptions to the popliteal vessels. Clinical assessment of palpation of pulses, looking for side-to-side -side difference is the starting point. Ankle brachial index, ultrasound Doppler, and angiography, both formal and ultrasound guided, uh, are very useful. Uh, we use a selective vascular uh, assessment using an algorithm. Some centers do routine angiography on all patients, whereas multiple studies show it is safe to do a selective angiography approach. Essentially, if a patient's had a knee dislocation, we reduce the knee, and assess perfusion of the limb. If the limb is ischemic, they go to the operating theater for urgent angiography. If the limb is well perfused, the next step is to assess pulses. If there's any asymmetry in the pulses, then a CT angiogram is performed. But if the pulses are symmetrical, we add an ankle brachial index. If the ABI is less than 0.9, they have a CT angiogram. If it's more than 0.9, then ongoing clinical assessment over the next 24 hours is sufficient without the need for angi angiography. Neurological examination is critical. Up to a quarter of patients who have an acute postural corner injury will have an associated common perineal nerve or palsy. We want to assess the common perineal nerve uh, with dorsiflexion power, eversion power, and dorsal foot sensation, and the tibial nerve, plantar flexion power and sensation. And just like the vascular structures, it should be assessed pre and post reduction, looking for any changes. There's a complex algorithm for how to manage these if there are significant you know, disruption. Fortunately, the majority uh, traction uh, neuropraxias, which we'll recover. In the case of uh, complete palsy and transection, uh, it's a complex algorithm as described there. You wanna reduce and stabilize the knee. Usually simple inline traction is sufficient. Embracing should be the minimal amount required to maintain a stable congruent reduction. Simple external splinting with either a Zimmer splint or a hinge range of motion brace is sufficient. 
Then those patients that present with outer dislocation, simply isolated post rotor corner injury, and a hinge range of motion brace is my first step. A plaster back slab offers the option of molding and is used in the short term in a small number of patients. And in those with very severe injuries, such as open dislocations, vascular injuries requiring repair, or where we cannot maintain, uh, main, obtain or maintain a reduction, or are unbraceable when they need an external fix at all. The diagnosis of acute post corner injury comes off the history, uh, clinical examination, and then the imaging. I have the clinical examination in brackets because we'll go through a whole host of exams which are, uh, are specific for the post corner, but in that acute high energy injury, it's usually pretty clear if they've disrupted the post side. You look for bruising and then you do the uh, assessment of coronal and rotary stability. The x-ray, if there's been a dislocation, is obvious, but if it's reduced, can be normal, but look for flex of bone around the postural corner, particularly the fibular head where revulsions can be common. MRI scan is the workhorse, and in these acute cases, disruptions there will be easily identifiable. CT scan has a role to play if there's fracture, if no fracture, not necessarily needed. In the delayed postural corner, history is the key, along with a detailed clinical examination. Imaging can be surprisingly normal in the chronic case. X-rays and even MRI scans may show no uh, clue to the injury, but stress X-rays become particularly useful here, uh, as does gait analysis. X-ray and MRI scan as described are the workhorse. The MRI scan shows the pattern of disruption, the site of disruption, it guides the surgery, and it shows associated chondral or meniscal injuries. Examination of the postural corner includes external rotation recovatum, varus stress at zero and 30, the external rotation posterior draw sign, the dial test, the reverse pivot shift and gait analysis. The first four are useful in both acute or chronic cases, though the amount of trauma often makes it a very painful and cautious patient who may not let you allow perform the performance of all these tests. The reverse pivot shift and gait are reserved for use in chronic assessment. External rotation recovatum involves simply isolating, holding, supporting the femur and then lifting the foot up by the great toe. You can quantify it by looking for how high the heel is raised from the bed compared to the other side. Various stress is tested at zero and 30 degrees. 30 degrees isolates the lateral collateral ligament. If it's positive at 30, but not at zero, uh, it's a grade two injury. If it's positive at zero and 30, it's a higher grade injury, often with associated injuries to the cruciates have a closer look for common perineal nerve palsy or fibular head fractures. The external rotation posterior draw sign is done at 70 degrees of flexion. The foot is uh, steadied, usually with me sitting on the toes and the put knee is put in, uh, the tibia is put in 15 degrees of external rotation. An anterior and posterior draw is then applied uh, as a combined uh, or coupled posterior and external rotation force and it's compared to the other side. The dull test is done with the patient prone External rotation is measured at 30 and 90 degrees. The positive test is more than 15 degrees side to side difference. And there are three possible outcomes. One, there's no difference, suggesting the post corner is intact. Two, difference at 30 degrees, but not 90 degrees, indicates an isolated post corner injury. And three, positive at 30 and 90, indicates combined post corner and PCL injury. One thing to note is we should watch out for medial injuries, which can give you a false positive. With a significant medial injury, you will get a rotary instability. The reverse pivot shift is more applicable in the chronic case. It's hard to do this test in a patient who's had an acute postural corner injury due to pain and apprehension. The knees flex to 90 degrees and external rotation and valgus is applied. In this position, if the postural corner is deficient, the tibia will be sublux postrolaterally. Then extend the knee, and in the case where it started subluxed, it will reduce as the IT band goes from a flexor to an extensor as it passes the flexion axis of the femur, and you'll feel a reduction. It's the opposite to the pivot shift. However, this isn't a very sensitive or specific test. Up to 35% of normal knees will be positive. So compare it to the other side uh, and use it as part of the puzzle uh, rather than a definitive test. Gate looking for a varus thrust. Uh, or hyperextension is useful and the true gait analysis can be very useful if you have access to it. Stress x-rays are particularly useful in the chronic case, uh, though uh, in some centers they'll be used acutely. You're looking for a side-to-side -side difference with clinician applied force uh, measured uh, on the x-ray in the lateral compartment. More than two millimeters of opening suspects isolated lateral collateral ligament injury. More than four millimeters suspects grade three injury which is a rupture of the LCL, 
popliteus, popliteus, fibula, and um, capsule along with IT band. If we start to think about the management, the summary essentially comes from mobile ligament injury. Operative treatment does better than non-operative treatment. Reconstruction of the cruciates in the postural corner does better than um, isolated repair. Isolated repair has higher revision rates. Early surgery does better than delayed surgery. There's multiple papers looking at this. Kevin Tetsworth paper uh, meta-analysis nicely shows that early surgical intervention in multi-ligament injuries, including the post corner, produces significantly better results compared to late reconstruction. Bruce Levy's group uh, looked at five studies comparing early surgery and showed a higher mean Lysholm score, a higher percentage of good to excellent results, higher sports activity score. The conclusion being early surgery is better than delayed treatment. The optimal time for surgery is about the second week, day seven to 14. I like to do these around day 10. There is sufficient time for capsular healing to allow for atheroscopy without excessive extravasation of fluid. But there's also still uh, not enough scarring that you can't easily dis dissect out the repairable structures. It's the best of both worlds. And obviously this, the clinical evidence supports early intervention. Repair versus reconstruction suggests that isolated repair alone has higher rates of failure. There's higher return to sports with combined reconstruction and repair and augmenting postural corner repairs uh, along with bony avulsions is uh, suggested. Uh, this paper is a meta-analysis performed by Rob Lepage group looking at the success uh, of acute postural corner treatment. Overall, the success rate's high, 81%. It's 91% wherever a reconstruction was performed, dropping to 62% if it was an isolated repair. So this is pretty clear evidence that you want to, whilst you want to repair all the structures that you can, an isolated repair has up to a 40% chance of failure. So I always do a reconstruction and combine it with repair. Reconstruction is focused on re reconstructing the significant anatomy, the lateral collateral ligament, the popliteo fibula and the popliteus. There are multiple techniques from tendon transfers and capsular procedures to fibula-based slings through to anatomical tibia and fibula-based reconstructions. The way I approach it is that for grade two injuries, I, I do a fibula-based or RCRO type technique uh, with a, two tunnels in the femur uh, based upon the anatomy that Laprade showed us uh, and a single anterolateral to posteromedial uh, oblique tunnel on the fibula to reconstruct the LCL and a uh, combined version of the popliteus and popliteo fibula ligament. In grade three injuries, I do a tibia and fibula-based technique initially described by Laprade uh, here, showing the anatomy. I've adapted that, uh, the type of graph to Robinson's technique. So uh, Rob used uh, a split Achilles tendon in the tibia, giving two tails, one coming up uh, to perform the LCL and by passing through the fibula tunnel and the other heading up as the popliteus. I've adapted that to a single either allograft or semitendinosus passed over an adjustable loop uh, in the tibial tunnel so that you can fix it, a single loop that runs down from the LCL down to the anterolateral fibula tunnel back, doubled section goes in to the tibia at the back, one loop comes out again uh, as the popliteus, and then it's adjustable on the tibial side through the adjustable button. Same route, single graft adjustable loop. The surgical approach was well described by Laprade and Terry. The full approach allows the access through a large posterolateral skin flap giving uh, identification and access to the entire postural corner. It's based on three fascial windows, one behind the biceps femoris, one between the biceps femoris and the IT band, one through the IT band. Window one allows access to the fibula. Most importantly, you can identify and protect the common perineal nerve. You can also access the fibula head where the insertion of the lateral collateral ligament, the popliteo fibula ligament and the tibia, back of the tibia can be found. The second fascial window is between the biceps femoris and the IT band uh, for graft passage and access to the postural capsule. It's also where you'll find uh, the, the avulsed fraction of fragment of the LCL. The third is through the split in the IT band to give the insertion on the femur. This uh, large postural uh, flap approach can be minimized depending upon where you need to access even to percutaneous incisions in the chronic cases where there's nothing to repair, uh, depending upon surgical skill and what you need to access. 
In the acute case, you're going to do a reconstruction and repair. You're probably going to need the large postrolateral flap. In the delayed case, where it's a reconstruction only, you can use limited incisions or even a percutaneous approach to just access the bony uh, insertion points. Graft selection, there's multiple options, uh, autograft, allograft. The fact is to consider what graft you need, what graft you can get, and what's the cost of getting it. The evidence is extrapolated from the single ligament data, mainly ACLs, and hamstrings versus allograft. Autograft does better than allograft. The preparation of the allograft is critical. You want to use non-irradiated graft if you're going to use uh, allograft. But these little long-term data on synthetics that I'm using internal braces to augment uh, as, uh, parts of the postlateral corner reconstruction. In chronic cases, you want to consider alignment as an osteotomy alone can overcome postural corner instability and soft tissue reconstruction alone is prone to failure in various malalignment. Multiple studies show good clinical results with osteotomy alone, sometimes negating the need for a second stage in these chronic cases. And it proves the outcome for patients who have had combined osteotomy and postural corner rates. So acute injuries with normal alignment have soft tissue surgery. Delayed injuries with varus malalignment or a thrust get a soft tissue combined with an osteotomy. The outcomes are good. Uh, mean Lysholm score in Rob Laprade's meta-analysis was almost 90, IKTZ of 84 and 81% success overall, but 91% success in all those cases where reconstruction was added. In the chronic case, it was similar with a mean Lysholm score of 86, IKTZ of 76 and 90% success overall. There's not enough data to suggest one surgical technique over the other. If we want to summarize the difference between acute and chronic, in the management focus in the acute, you need to focus on the patient, not just the knee. It's an acute trauma with a lot of associated injuries. In the chronic case, you generally focus just on the knee. In the acute case, diagnosis is simple with an obvious presentation and clear findings on MRI. Whereas in the chronic case, it's harder as the um, MRI scan will often be normal. You need a detailed history, a detailed clinical exam and good stress x-rays. Acute surgery is generally ligament reconstruction combined with whatever's repairable. It's a larger dissection because you're going to be able to access all the things that need repair. In the chronic case, it'll be reconstruction plus or minus osteotomy if there's various malalignment. And you may be able to take a more minimally invasive approach on the postural side. The outcomes overall are very good provided reconstruction is combined with repair. And they're very good in the chronic case provided alignment's managed along with the soft tissue postural corner. So in summary, the postural corner is an area of complex anatomy. It's a primary strength of varus and external rotation and works in co-function with the ACL and PCL. We've got fascial windows to approach the insertion points on the bony anatomy to perform our reconstructions and our surgical approach is guided by those. Awareness of the context of injury is key. In acute settings, associated injuries and neurovascular management are important. Manage the whole patient reduce the knee and keep it stable, image it appropriately, and plan your definitive management. The definitive management of the acute injury, operative is better than non-operative treatment. Early surgery does better than late with the second week being optimal. In surgery, there are multiple reconstruction techniques available, tailor it to the specific injury and your skills. If you're going to repair, always add a reconstruction. So everything's a reconstruction plus repair what's repairable. Repair alone has an almost four times higher failure rate than reconstruction. Approach is determined by what structures need access and surgical familiarity. And the results are very good. It's increasingly anatomical reconstructions are being performed. But keep in mind, we're never able to reconstruct the dynamic component of the popliteus. More anatomic leads to better restoration of biomechanics in the lab. So fibula-based reconstructions alone will restore various stability and some degree of rotation. To restore ER and coupled ER posterior translation fully, you need a tibia and fibula-based recon. So for me, in grade two injuries, I do a fibula-based reconstruction. In grade three, I do a tibia and fibula-based reconstruction. And in the chronic case, I always consider alignment. Thank you.